Hello, this is Douglas Rumbaugh. Now, in this video, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Now, I want to emphasize that this is not going to be a tutorial video or anything like that. Uh, now, the reason why I say that is that although I will be, I guess, demonstrating how to do some programming, this is nothing that I am particularly expert at. As a matter of fact, I am just learning how to do this for the first time myself. So this is less of me showing you how to do something and more of me recording myself figuring out how to do something. Uh, so what that means is that there are guaranteed to be... Yeah, uh, so what this means is that best practices will probably be non-existent. I'll be hacking things to get them to work and cleaning them up later. Don't emulate me. This is just me figuring this stuff out. I figured it might be fun to, to record uh, and demonstrate it, if only because that sort of thing helps me learn better. So what exactly are we going to be doing? Oh, well, I've always wanted to learn how to develop GUI applications. It's actually not something that I've really done much of uh, outside of, you know, like Microsoft Foundation class and WinForms and little, you know, drag and drop GUI interfaces on Android and you know, stuff like that. Uh, but really learning a, a uh, a GUI framework and writing program, writing meaningful applications using that GUI framework is not something that I've really done much of. I've always been more of a back-end server database kind of programmer. So I figured while I'm currently in my mode of being relatively enamored with GNOME, let, I'm going to try and figure out how to make GNOME applications. So to that end, I have pulled up over here and uh, on my other monitor, the one of the developer tutorial pages for developing GNOME applications. Uh, and I'm going to be working through that. Now I've actually already done this, but I'm going to run through it again and kind of explain explain what I think thing what I think of things and try and get everything working as we go. So incidentally, when I'm looking off at this over here like this, uh, that is me looking at my my secondary monitor here with the documentation. So you'll you'll be able to see pretty easily what's coming out of my head and what's being read off of a web page. I will link the documentation that I'm referencing in the uh, description of this video. The default example that it has here is just um, like an empty window and then we put a hello world button on it that closes the window when we click it. So it's pretty pretty simple initial example. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So let's take a look at this. We'll go for example 0.c. And the first thing we're going to have to do is include our header. So it's uh, gtk slash gtk 3.0 is the name of the header we need. Uh, now you'll note that right away my editor can't find it. So I'm playing around with, uh, with COC for my auto completion and IntelliSense and all of that stuff. It's working relatively well. I'm, I've, I've, I've used Syntastic a lot and uh, you complete me, but COC is pretty cool. If you don't, I, it kind of annoys me that you have a, I have a massive like Node.js thing running in the background when I'm using it, but yeah. So I'm using uh, COC with the CCLS uh, language server as the backend for it for developing it in C. Now the problem is I need to actually because the GTK libraries are not located on my in the standard um, include path for C, I'm going to have to tell it where they are. Now I'm sure there is a better way of doing this, uh, but one quick and dirty way to do it is to put a a dot CCLS file here in your project root, and then into this you can basically put the command you're going to use to compile and including all your library includes and that will tell CCLS where to look and we should get those errors not only will the errors go away but we'll actually be able to use uh, the autocompletion which is going to be quite handy I'm not a big fan of autocomplete normally but when you're working with a big library like this it is really useful to be able to see what options you have, what, what functions are there, and, and that sort of thing. So we are going to want to get that working. Now, the way that we can figure out what we need to use is to use a command called package config. 
So if I go ahead and run pkg config and then give it, I'm gonna need C flags and also uh, not sil flag, C flags. And we're looking for GTK plus 3.0. How's that for a name, plus minus? And so this is basically going to output the necessary arguments that you have to pass into your, your GCC call in order to, or Clang if you prefer Clang, um, in order to compile. So we have the, the C flags and we also need, I believe it's lib, lib or libs, libs. So these are the include, and this is adding the include path, and this is actually linking the libraries, I believe. Uh, so we're going to have to make sure we pass all of these arguments into our comp compilation, which is not going to be nearly as bad as it sounds. I'll show you how to do that then. Uh, we could also use a make file, but I'm not gonna bother with that for this. Now we need to get these into my, um, .ccls file. So let's first, the first line of your ccls file should be the name of the compiler that you're using. Uh, and then we need to, and let me put a blank line there. And now we need to take the rest of the stuff and put those in there, each on their own line. So theoretically, we could just copy and paste all this stuff. And my cat has come to say hello. Uh, we could just copy and paste all this stuff in, but Let's do this a little bit more efficiently, right? So I'm going to begin by taking this and appending the output to my .ccls file. And we'll do the same thing for the C flags command. Output that to CCLS. And now the problem is that I need to make, I need to put all of this stuff on its own line. Uh, I, it, it can't be, separated like that with spaces, it has to be new lines. So I'm gonna to have to go through that file and replace all the spaces with new lines. And that's not too bad to do. Um, I'm going to go ahead and if I do sed, and I believe it is this, I'm gonna substitute space for new line across the entire file. I'm gonna use CCLS as the input. Yeah, okay. There we go. So that said command just allowed me to quick replace all the stuff and we'll get rid of that blank line. And now I'm just gonna move my temporary file onto .ccls, that. And now, theoretically, when I go to edit my file, it should work. It should work. Why is that not working? Oh, because that I typed the wrong thing. That should be gtk not dot h. There we go. Okay. Success. We're in business. Now that when you when we're working with a, uh, I'll start by writing the main function down here. Uh, when we are dealing with writing a GTK application. Our main function is going to basically create the application context, run the application, and then clean up afterwards. So we're gonna have to create an application. Now the, the way in which we run the application is a little bit interesting, and we'll get to that when we get to that, but we'll have to run the application, and then, um, oh, ha, doy. Can you tell that I've written a lot of Python code lately? Uh, and then we have to do final cleanup. That's gonna be the general structure of our main. And of course the actual application code, the, the thing that runs is gonna be a, a function somewhere else. So let's begin by actually creating our application here. So we have We're gonna to wanna to create a, or declare a GTK application variable here. We'll call it app. 
And of course, we'll want a status code for the application. Now to actually do our application creation, we're, we're basically going to call a constructor. So the, the, um, the framework that we're using for GTK is, is kind of object-oriented-ish. In fact, I believe it, it is object-oriented. So it's kind of, kind of funny doing object-oriented programming in C, but yeah. Obviously, we're not using dot notation or anything like that. We're, it's a procedural object-oriented, uh, kind of like what Python does, I guess. But it should work just fine anyway. So we're going to actually create our application by calling the constructor uh, GTK application new. We have to give this application a name. Uh, so I'm just going to go org.gtk.myapplication. Not. And... Then the second thing that it takes are application flags. I'm not entirely sure what what options we have for application flags and what they're going to do. I'm just going to pass in this guy. Uh, what is it? application flags? None. So we are not going to use any application flags. Nothing special. So that actually creates our application object. Now to run the application we're going to call a function called g application run. That makes sense. And we pass into that our application. And we also pass into there argc and argv. Now, you'll notice I have a little orange squiggly around app, and I have a feeling I know exactly why. Incompatible pointer types. Yep. So one of the things that you have to bear in mind when you're doing this development, it seems, is there are a bunch of casting macros for all of the different types of UI elements that we have. So obviously here we just have the app. When we actually get into writing the window, we're going to have a window and we're going to have buttons and things like that. And because this is C and we don't have methods, we basically pass these things into functions as the first argument to fake having methods, right? So in order to ensure that these things are of the correct type, uh, it wants you to use these, these special casting macros, which are going to basically do the type check for you at compile time and throw a warning if you're doing something wrong. So in principle, I think this code should run, but we're going to do it correctly. And the way you do that is it's just the, the type name in all caps, like that, like that. And so that's going to verify that it is in fact an application object, or I suppose it's a, uh, a pointer to an application object that we are passing into our, our application run. And then once the application has run, uh, we can do our final cleanup using this g object unref, uh, which is going to allow us to free our application. And presumably that handles recursively cleaning up everything, I assume. Uh, yeah, you're not going to give me much in the way of useful help there, are you? No. I assume that's going to handle freeing everything. Now there's one more thing that we're going to have to do, which is we have to actually tell our program what it means to run the application. So this is going to trigger the application to run, but the way that GTK seems to work is it uses signals. So obviously when you're doing UI development, you're working with event-driven programming where you have events like clicking on a button and you link to that event some code that runs. So when I click on a button, the program then executes some code. And so the program itself is kind of sitting there in a loop waiting for events. And then as the user interacts with the application, events get triggered and then those events cause the program to run certain code. The way that it's handled here, doing GTK app or 
doing GTK stuff in C is by using signals. So kind of like the kill command, right, is used to send signals to processes. It's the same basic idea as we're going to have defined signals. And then when it receives a signal, we will define what's called a signal handler, which is a function that gets called when the application sees a particular signal. So what we're going to do is I'm going to create a new function, which is basically going to contain the actual code of my application. This stuff down here is all boilerplate. So let's see, what should we, um, what should I call this thing? I'll just use the same name they do in the documentation. So we have static void activate. And this is going to accept an application pointer. And it is going to accept a pointer to data. I'm not 100% sure what that user data is. I assume that you can, it's uh, a generic structure you can chuck various data into that you want to pass around the application. Uh, but I haven't actually gotten into what that means just yet. Now then, this is where we're going to actually create our, um, create our UI and, and make it do stuff. Uh, but we need to tell our application that when it receives that run signal, it needs to call this function. And the way that we're going to do that is by using the G signal connect. So like here, if we look at G signal, we have G signal new, which lets you define signals. Emit is sending a signal. Uh, so there's a bunch of different stuff you can do here with signals. We're going to connect a signal. And this signal connect is going to take in the application first. So this instance here, we're connecting it to the app. So when the app receives the signal, I think. So we have our app run. And then we need to pass in the detailed signal, which is a name for the signal. So I guess each signal has a string name that you use to reference it. And for us, our signal is called activate. Then we need to define the callback function. So the way that you're going to do that is type the function. We want Our activate function is going to be our callback. Uh, however, again, just like with we saw with app down here, we actually have to pass this through a casting function, which is a g callback. Or I'm sorry, I believe this is a macro, not a function. Oops. And we also need to specify uh, the, another G pointer data. So this is what's gonna get passed in here for user data, I believe. And we are going to pass null because we don't have anything to, anything to pass. So now theoretically, when we run this program, uh, it should link the signal, this sends the signal, and then we're gonna hop up here and do this stuff. So into here is where we can actually create our GUI. So we're gonna actually create our interface. And what that's going to look like is we're going to just create a window with a title initially. So all of your UI elements are going to be GTK widgets. And then you can use these casting macros here to force them to be, or to force them into the specific type you need for a given context. Uh, so we're, we'll create our, or rather declare our window. And now we're going to create our window again using what's effectively a constructor call, I think. So G GTK application window new. And we pass our app into here. So I believe this is going to create a new window and then link it to this application. And now we can establish the, basically the title and the size of the window and then tell it to show the window. So GTK window set title, uh, we will pass in our window. Once again, we want that, that macro and then we do the title, my window. And then we need to set the default size And we'll go 
ahead and pass window into there. And let's make it 200 by 200. And then finally, we need to tell it to show the window. So that's GTK show all. GTK widget show all. And then we will pass our window here. Note, no cast required here because this is a widget function. So it, it doesn't need necessarily need to be a window. It can be any widget, I think. Whereas these are window functions, so it requires the window. And yeah, that actually, I believe, should work. So now we just have to compile this thing and run it. And let me go ahead and just turn my... I can never remember this keyboard shortcut to turn tiling off. Toggle floating mode is super G. Of course, that made up in size, not that. Oh, wait. No, that wasn't what I wanted. I floated that specific window, not um, not all the windows. I'm still learning this damn thing. <laughs> uh, super Y. Oh. Oh, you just press super Y to toggle back and forth. That makes sense. There we go. Okay, so now we have to compile this thing. Now what's, pretend, what, what's at first gonna be kind of scary is remember that in order to actually, uh, oh, not type. In order to actually compile this thing, we have to run the command that has all of these things attached to it. But we can take advantage of um, bash parentheses or quotation expansion to take care of that. Uh, so if you're unaware of how this works, this is really pretty cool. So if I were to say pkg config c flags and it's uh, GTK plus dash 3.0, right? This is the, the flags we have to pass into our compiler in order to compile with these header files. It's what t what's telling us where all this stuff is. Now I could type all those in, or if I do this, GCC, I'm gonna run the GCC compiler, backtick, pkg config, C flags, GTK plus da 3.0 backtick. What this command is gonna, what this is gonna do is it's going to run this command, take the output of this command and replace the stuff in backticks with it. So we're effectively taking the, taking the standard output of this command and passing it in as an argument to GCC, which is really cool. Um, so we'll call our output example zero. We're going to, of course, compile example zero. And then we also need the, um, need the, to link the libraries in. So pkg configs, or just config libs gtk plus minus 3.0 backtick. There we go. So that command ran these two things and then took their outputs and pass them as additional arguments to GCC. So as you can see, I now have this example zero file. And if I run that, look, I have a window. Fail to load module, app menu, GTK menu. Hmm. Wonder what that is and if that's gonna be a problem. I'm go we'll proceed as though that's not a problem and then see what happens. <laughs> So that would be what that's looks like a, a dynamic link that failed. 
means I may be missing it. I may be missing some libraries. We'll find out. Anyway, let's go ahead and modify this into a new. a new program which does the same thing but it also has a button. So we can leave all this stuff the same. I'm going to change the name of our application here to my button app, I guess. I have a button. Or really what? Hello button. We'll call it hello button. None of this is going to have to change. Uh, we are going to have to put in our button now. So I need a new GTK widget. I'm actually going to need two GTK wi widgets. I have my button. And I'm also going to have a button box. Now the button box ow, is going to be, you know, let's use proper C names. This is going to be the BTTNBX. Perfectly clear, right? Button box. Uh, the button box handles the layout. So the button box is the space in which the button goes, and then the button will fill up the button box. I think that's going to become more significant when we have UIs that actually have multiple things in it, and we have to pack them and arrange them appropriately. And you can use button boxes for that. Uh, but we're going to need a button and a button box. So. There we go. Let's create our button box, and you will never guess how that's done. I'm gonna guess it's something like GTK button box. New. Yep. And now this takes an orientation. So this is gonna be whether your buttons are stacked horizontally or vertically. Uh, we just have one button, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, the the documentation says you to use GTK orientation horizontal. So I figure it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. What's next? Why am I getting... Okay, that's weird. One second, that's gonna bug me now that I've noticed that. My code is indented three times rather than, or three spaces rather than four. There we go. Much better. I'm sure some of you were looking at that and screaming. <laughs> okay, so there's our button box. And we are going to add the box to the window is a GTK container add. We have our window. I believe I'm going to have to cast this as a window. Yes. No. Well, no, actually, I don't cast it as a window. I cast it as a container. Makes sense. And then the button box doesn't get cast at all. Like that. That adds our button box to the window. And now I have to create a button and add the button to the button box. Makes sense. I'm assuming that's gonna be GTK button new. And do you take any inputs? Guess not. Oh, no, a button new with label. Okay, and now you're gonna take a label. And then we are going to need to add that to our container. And I'm assuming it's gonna be GTK container button box. And we are adding the button to it. Correct? Correct. Sweet. Uh, so now all we have to do is actually determine what happens when you press the button. Now, just like our application run is handled by connecting the signal 
the activate signal to a callback function or a signal handler. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for the button. So we're basically going to have a clicked signal and we're going to link that to a function. And in our case, I believe it's just going to show hello world on the terminal. Yes. So let's go ahead and do that. So we are going to, uh, where should I put this? There's the button, let's put it here. So again, same way as before, we're gonna use with the application itself, we use G signal connect. And we are going to want to connect button. And that button has a clicked signal. So we're taking the clicked signal from that particular button and we are defining a callback to a function we have yet to create called print hello and no user data for that function. Interesting, you're not throwing a hissy fit over print hello. I'm disappointed in you. And we're going to just create another thing. And this is going to take a GTK widget and a, what is that, a G pointer? G pointer, one word. Okay. And for here, we're going to do a G print hello world. Neat. So now, theoretically, this should print hello world when we click the button. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. I'll go ahead and just recall this guy. Example one dot C, example one. Okay. We've got ourselves our button. Hey, yay, we have a functional application that does something. Cool. Uh, now there is one more line in the tutorial documentation, which is they do a signal connect swapped as well. And that is a button clicked. Call it, and we'll call it a destructor. Now, GTK signal swapped or signal connect swapped is a little different. Here, let me actually pull this documentation window over on the screen here. Uh, so, where are we? Next swap. Here we are. Okay. So if I'm not mistaken, I believe the difference between connect and connect swapped has to do with the fact that when we call connect swapped, you see the button, if the button is the thing that gets clicked. So that's what's sending the signal. But when we do our callback, we're passing in window rather than button. So if we look here at this normal guy, when I when I handle this, when I get this G callback print hello, the thing that actually gets passed in as the first argument here is, is the button itself. And in fact, I can demonstrate that by doing something like this. Um, there. So the button, see that when I click the button, it switches to the text to hello, like that. So what's happening is this button, the actual button that the signal is connected to, or the, rather the button that um, is sending the signal, gets passed in as the first argument to my callback. Now what I believe this connect swapped function seems to be doing is it swaps the, the first argument 
to the callback function. So rather than this callback, which it destroy getting the button, it's getting the window. As a matter of fact, I'm curious. I'm curious what happens if I do this instead. If I just do a G signal connect like this, if this is going to destroy the button, I suspect it will. Yeah, look at that. So what this connect swap seems to allow us to do is to take the um, take a, an event triggered from this button and then instead of the callback function handling the button, it's handling something else. So we're destroying the window rather than the button. And then of course, as you saw when I accidentally did it, what the net effect of that line is, is, whoop, lost it, there we go, is it, uh, it nukes the window. So that's pretty neat. Let me just double check that that's actually what this documentation says since I went through all the trouble of finding it. Uh, the instance on which the signal is emitted and data will be swapped when calling the handler. This is useful when calling pre-existing functions that operate purely upon data rather than da da da. Yeah, okay, so it swaps instance with data. Okay. So yeah, that's what's happening then is this window is getting basically passed in as the first thing rather than button. Pretty cool. And that brings us to the end of the first section in the, in the documentation here. Uh, now, one thing I want to try and figure out is getting this to work, because if I'm not mistaken, let me make sure I understand how um, static, I want I to A, right? I'm pretty sure that's the right function. So the A to I stuff is what converts a string to a number. Or yeah, a, a string or an array of characters. C doesn't really have strings. Um, see also A to F. Okay, so do we have that perhaps? New. Okay. That's it. I swear, it has been such a long time since I've actually written code in C. You just forget everything. Um, spent spent way too much time in Python land because that's what I teach. <laughs> so I'm going to create this, and I'm going to use sprintf here to to do this. So the way sprintf works is it's basically printf except instead of writing the result to a to standard output the way printf does is it writes the result to a buffer so what i've done is i've created a, a character buffer of five characters which is pro tip is actually only four characters because of the null terminator um, and what we're going to do is i'm going to use sprintf to print my integer as a string and then i can pass that as input into my set label. This has nothing to do with GNOME development, but I want to make sure that I can actually remember how to do this properly. Um, where's the... OK, 
Okay, so sprintf takes the buffer. No, that's the notes. So where's the where's the signal? Oh, door right here. All right, so char star string and format, and then the var args. Okay, yeah. So sprintf is going to take the buffer as the first, and then it is going to take the format string as the second, and then that. So what this should do is this should basically create a string that has i in it. Um, and as long as we don't press the button more than what a thousand times or four characters would be nine thousand. If we if we press it ten thousand times, we'll break. And then can I just pass message in there? That there we go. Look at this. I know how to program. Maybe. We'll see if I remember what these static variables do properly. Okay. Oop. Oh, because I didn't turn off the this. Ah, it's resetting the zero every time. Okay. So that's no that's no good. I guess I could make it a global variable, which would be silly. Maybe can I use this G pointer user data thing? Would that be an option? Pointer. Like is it as simple as doing something like this? So if I do int i equals zero, and then I could do for my signal connect, instead of null, G pointer i, well not i, but um, the reference to i, like that. I think I do int star i equals user data. Will that work? And then we can dereference i that. Oh, it may, actually, that may have been working because I never actually incremented i. <laughs> uh, this is this is a better solution than um, using a using a freaking static variable if it works anyway. Uh, so we'll print it. And can I? Now we'll just this do this in two steps. Oh, let me try this. So we'll dereference i. Can I dereference i and then increment it like that? I'm not sure if that's going to increment the value of i or if that's going to increment the pointer to i. In any case, let me actually start this thing out at something other than zero to give me a a fighting chance at seeing if this actually works. Woo! All right, that's a lot of a lot of fun times. Um, warnings: implicit declaration of function g pointer. Oh, it doesn't doesn't like this g pointer thingy, huh? I guess that's not a thing. Or do I have to give it that? No. All right, let's just get rid of all of that entirely here. Just pass in a pointer. All right, that got rid of all the warnings. Um, 
I feel like there is a, a cast or a conversion I should be doing here. But uh, we can I'll look that up next time. Okay, so that doesn't... seem to be working. We have a zero there. We have a zero there and we should be seeing an 11, right? Well, interestingly, it's called a it's called a G pointer, but it's not declared as a pointer. Oh, no, so G pointer is literally just an alias to void pointer. And I guess because there's a star in the type def already, we don't have to worry about that. So that is just a G, that is just a void pointer. Interesting. So what that tells me is, let me get rid of this plus plus and see if that's working. Because it's possible that that all that what this is doing is this is actually uh, incrementing the pointer rather than incrementing the number. And if it increments the pointer, then it's probably driving it into um, an empty an empty chunk of memory, which would. Makes sense. Nope, we're still getting zero there. I am actually recompiling example one, right? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yes, I know, I know, you don't like that. Um, I guess I can try, no. Yeah, that's just a warning though. <laughs> of course, you're not actually printing anything. Oh, there they all are. Why did I wait until after I? Probably because I'm using printf. Um, I should use that that gprint thing. What's that called? Is it just gprint? Yeah. Gprint. I guess this is a way I can test to see if that pointer itself increments. Now, uh, well, yeah. Let me do this. So we'll go ahead, paste this guy here. We'll do that and that. And this will at least tell us, I think, if the, if the pointer itself is incrementing. Yes, I know warnings. And this, by the way, is what you call experimenting for the sake of figuring out how stuff works without searching for it because you don't feel like searching for it. <laughs> All right, so those are two different pointers. So what, we went down by four? Yeah, okay, so that, that plus plus there is, is, is actually incrementing the, um, it's actually incrementing the pointer itself and not the number. I guess that would make sense.
So let's see if I wanted to make sure that I incremented the the number, would I do that? Yeah, okay, so I think that will increment the number rather than incrementing the pointer. That's good. Let me do that. And now I'm going to go ahead and dereference this here in the gprints. See what that looks like. Zero one. Zero one zero one zero one. Okay. So what's happening is this user data pointer is pointing at some memory that has zero in it. Um, I'm curious when this, will this gprint only run once? I don't know, let's find out. Do inactivate So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to print the address of i. There, and I'm going to print the address of i here. And we'll see if they are the same. All right, so yes. Yes, they are. Okay. So the question then becomes, why is it that here I am still seeing zero? All right, because I should be 11. That shouldn't be necessary. Oh, it would help if I compiled it first. Okay. 16 EA7 A9C, 16 EA7 A9C. Yeah, so those are, those, that, that pointer is getting passed in there properly. Am I missing? Is it just that? No, okay. It's not, not as simple as that. It's strange to me that you're not we're not putting a not putting a star on that.
And if I just put like 10 in here, like that. We get 10, okay, good. Now if I say int j equals 10, I put j in, put j in there. I recompile, no. Get 10, okay. So if I say int star k, it's equal to ampersand j, and I make this a star k, we get 10. So that's working. So the sprintf is doing its job. The pointers are pointing at the same thing. Do I have to declare this as static, maybe? Oh, of course, now I haven't recompiled it yet. So why am I getting 10? 11. 11, 11, okay. So now we're getting 11 anyway. Apparently this guy needs to be static. I guess that makes sense actually, because, right, we're not in a call stack, right? I'm not, this activate function isn't calling print hello and passing this in. So although I can give it the memory address of this thing, right? If this activate stack frame isn't there, then it's going to be zero. I bet you that's what it is. Yeah. Because the there's a there's a main program loop buried in here somewhere, and it's probably buried here. Uh, and so this this function gets called once, but I don't think this function stays active. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a I'm creating a local variable on the stack for activate here, and then I'm trying to pass the location of that variable as the data for my callback. Now if this function were still on the stack in the same spot, then this would work. But because it's not a question of this function calls this function, what, what I think is happening is uh, this function returns, uh, it's, this function sets everything up and then returns control back to wherever the main program loop is buried in this library somewhere. Uh, and so the stack frame which contains this 11 isn't there anymore. Uh, so as a result of that, the pointer to this 11 doesn't um, persist. Now you use static like this in order to make this thing static. Once it's declared, it's there. And so I think that's the issue that we're having with that. Almost certainly. Which means that maybe if I allocated I on... Let me try this. Static int star i. Malloc size of int. And get rid of static. There we go. So if I allocate this on the heap instead, then I do star i equals, say, 11 to begin with.
and then we can go up here and let me well first let me make sure the 11 shows up and then I'll try incrementing it okay we don't actually see 11 <laughs> fun 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 Three ninety two. Why would we be seeing three ninety two? Pointers are all the same, yeah. So let me let me at least uh, see if our increment works now. No, it does not. It does not. Now, why is that not work? Oh, wait. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Let's get rid of that ampersand, shall we? Because now I is a pointer. Or dump. <laughs> Stack smashing detected. Terminated. Okay, so I guess we can't even do that, huh? Interesting, interesting, interesting. So it does not like me trying to access that value. Well, I guess... That's still probably going to be the same problem. No, wait, hold up. Okay. So that works. You get 11. Uh, so the issue there was I, um, I was accessing the... I wasn't, ac I wasn't dereferencing the pointer. I'm not sure why dereferencing the pointer makes me suddenly allowed to access that memory. But, uh, okay. So let's try this now. Eleven? Twelve? Yeah! Woo! <laughs> oh boy. Hooray! That makes me happy. Of course, I'm not entirely sure how we're supposed to free this thing now. But it works. Yeah. I just out of curiosity, how bad is it? How bad is it when this happens? <laughs> so I'm basically about to. You know, I don't need these prints anymore. Let's get rid of these. Let's get rid of this and get rid of this and get rid of all those warnings. Okay, no warnings. Good. So I'm a bit curious what's going to happen now. So I'm basically going to force a buffer overflow, and we'll see what weirdness happens. Uh, so the problem is my my character buffer here that I'm using to store the, the text for the button is now only two characters wide. And of course in C you have the the first, you have the the last character in a string is always going to be a a null character. That's a null terminator at the end of the string. I'm actually not one hundred percent sure. I assume sprintf puts a null terminator on. In fact I can probably check that. Um, functions, produce output formatted, da, da, da. Um, all these functions, right? Format of the string. String exposure zero more. All right, that's the, for uh, the format of the format string. Yeah, I don't really care about that. 
field width, decision, length, fires, turn value, excluding the null. Yeah, okay, so there is an, I assume that means there is a null byte there. So theoretically, when I click this button one more time, um, we're going to get a buffer overflow here uh, because our character buffer is only two characters wide and currently it contains nine null. And as soon as I press go here, uh, we'll be 10 null, which is three characters wide. But it does, that does not appear to be a critical failure point this specific runtime, but I, I believe we are currently overflowing the buffer. Let's get it up to 100. There it goes, okay. Maybe there isn't a null terminator on that thing. So that stack smashing detected, that was, this was it detecting that buffer overflow. Uh, I'm curious, if I just make this one, <laughs> talk about dumb. Yeah, okay, so it, it does write a null, null character. Um, and the, the, error, the warning that we're getting here is that it is going to overflow because the null is being written at the end. So we should get a buffer overflow immediately. Now what's interesting is it looks like it's actually not immediately dying until we get two characters overflowed, until the we get a character that's not the null that's overflowing, which is interesting. Um, but that does just kind of go to show you. I mean, oh, there it died. Yeah. So that time it died right away. That time it died right away. That time it died right away. Oh yeah, no, yeah, never mind. It, it that that's what we. Yeah. Uh, so, kind of that goes to show you, I guess, how pernicious these buffer overflows can be. They, they're they not always going to result in an immediate error. Because we were, we were technically, technically we are overflowing the buffer from this moment. Buffer's already overflowed. But we don't know that until there. And as a matter of fact, it would probably keep working if we turned that off. I believe you can turn off a lot of these security checks. And then it would continue to potentially continue to overflow the buffer and not crash like that. So yeah, buffer overflows can be a bit of a bit of a bitch to deal with if you're not careful. One of the one of the reasons why having a, a more modern language with actual built in checks for that is kind of nice. Avoids you having those issues. Anyway, I've been going at this for over an hour now. So I think we'll call that the end for this. This is basically just going to be screwing around, uh, revealing how little I remember about programming C, huh? Uh, so I hope that you found this somewhat interesting. Um, I'm going to continue to do this because I am interested in learning and figuring out how these libraries work. And really the best way for me to do that personally is, well, well what we were just doing, right? You, you write your example code and then you start tweaking it, and playing with it and trying to do different things. And we learned some interesting things about uh, memory allocation and the way that works here, where we're going to have, if we want to have data that we define inside of our, any of our functions, any of our callbacks, and we want it to be available in a different callback, we're apparently going to have to allocate that on the, on the heap rather than the stack. Uh, now that's not going to help me in terms of actually fixing the, we have a memory leak right now, and I don't have a good way of freeing this. And that's something I'm going to have to think about. Um, obviously, this whole issue could be resolved by using global variables. But I'm sure there's, there's a better way of doing it. In fact, there's probably an official GTK way of doing it that we may get to at some point through these, through the, through, through these dev tutorials. So it should be interesting to see what the the GTK approved technique for passing data around is when we get there. So yeah, hope that you found this interesting and I'll see you in the next one.